Demands of justice are commonly seen in this world. On the one hand, this is due to an observed imbalance in the realm, which is factual at any given time one looks. If one observes one particular moment or even a group of moments, it is evident that existence here suffers from a clear imbalance indeed. However, that lack of equilibrium is not motionless or stagnant. It shifts from side to side like the pendulum of a clock, marking the advantage for one side of the court and then to the other, as the playing field diminishes together with its inherent time. In truth, time is the factor that makes the imbalance observable, as it delays the shifting and makes the circumstances and context of each victor and of each defeated linger on just enough to make these undeniably felt to anyone here. Without time, if one was to be able to see all the moments of this dream at once, the picture would seem, in contrast, balanced and even, because none of its intermediate timed moments would have been experienced and only the final result would be there to observe. However, without time and our small temporary contexts within the world, choice, and more specifically moral choice, would have no background to emerge. The dream therapy mentioned in the contemplation of the same name relies on observation of context while within it, and on choice, which is not necessarily a choice of action, but mostly a choice of moral tonality, as one remembers without details what one most certainly is not. As detachment from identification gradually occurs, a sense of what is right and wrong, or better said, what is true and false, starts emerging. This does not lead to perfection, as, again, I reiterate what had been messaged in previous contemplations, perfection is unattainable here. So how can imperfection, such as ourselves, broken fragments as we are of a skewed originally reflected image, aim for that perfect original? We cannot, directly. That is not the essence of the therapy laid before us. We are not supposed to gradually approach perfection until some threshold is passed and so we can access our place in the original truth. Because perfection is unattainable for us, one cannot repeat this enough. What we can do is observe first, contemplate as is possible given our individual contexts, and then to choose in soul and in practice, in accordance to the realizations that emerged from such observation. In that way, instead of gaining something, we throw something away, something that was smudging our crystal, metaphorically speaking, and that was preventing it from shining with its essential, original and living light. In that sense, the crossing of this great and tumultuous river of context and time does not culminate in one finding some great lost treasure, but, quite contrastingly, it leads to, instead, one being found as being a great lost treasure himself. We do not find truth, invisible to us, lost in this blind nature, but truth finds us when we so allow it, through contemplation, choice and trust, or faith if that's your preferred word. This said, and going back to the matter titled in this presentation, what is justice that is so in demand at all times regardless? Justice is the placement of each fragment of life within this dream in such a context that matches each of their moral tonality and potential. 
the difference being that the moral tonality shows the present state, while moral potential defines the present tendencies, not necessarily yet manifested. Therefore, in that way the world is riddled with injustice when zoomed in by our individual involvement, but governed by justice when zoomed out and it is seen that our involvement in it fits the current or potential state of our fragments of life. Inherently, therefore, one can infer that when we demand justice from our individual context's point of view, we are actually clamoring for retribution. That is, we are desiring that the pendulum moves to the other side, something that it will do regardless given time. So, does retribution or vengeance solve anything apart from uh, supplying a temporary and ephemeral emotional fix for an individual or collective identification? Retribution is consequence for something that has not been forgiven. Therefore, the more retribution is applied, the more is left behind without forgiveness. And, consequently, the more retribution is potentially stored for future pendulum shifts. Still, like two mirrors facing each other, the more the reflected images bounce back from each of them, the smaller the images get. Inevitably, the images will reach a point when there is nothing there anymore to be reflected back, nothing to fuel the projected world. Won't that be unjust for those fragments that were not found by then? Justice is a matter of state of being, not a matter of consequence. Using a past metaphor from another presentation, the alembic will be reignited with whatever fragments are still left in the mash until none is left. Is that not just? Who am I is the question constantly being asked within, but not asked to an independent observer with nothing at stake, but to a dependent, blind participant. Answers are being given at every moment we are here, as if at each moment our votes are being cast to elect a contextual state of existence and the elected state of being will fit who we are by what we answered the question with, in tonality and potential, therefore doing us justice. Consequently, whatever state we find ourselves in, we should never consider ourselves to be one centimeter even above anyone else, because we are all placed here in justice. We fail to see our pride as often as much as we fail to see our shame. Whether we are leaning more to one or the other, they blind us. The proud will be unable to accept humility and the ashamed will be unable to, to accept dignity. Both are unable to see who they truly are. In the middle point, unable as they are, therefore, to be found as the long-sought treasures. Although entirely understandable and expected from us in our present state and predicament, it would seem to be best not to demand justice when faced with the imbalances of the world. Firstly, because it is already just, even if in the blindness of our senses, justice seems entirely absent. And secondly, because what we are truly demanding, consequently, is retribution, vengeance, blood. In other words, we are asking for a vent for our wrath. No conflict can be won by becoming the enemy. And in this conflict in particular, that is, the eternal war previously addressed in Contemplation 2, there can never be victory, because both sides feed and reflect each other. 
Vengeance is like blowing bellows onto a furnace that we ask justice to cool down. Wrath solves nothing, quite contrarily, but neither does sloth. And the dangerous idleness suggested by sloth is not one of lack of action, but of lack of observance and of internal and individual remembrance, because actions are a consequence of an inner state of being. The pendulum comes and goes eternally as long as time lasts, and at every passage we are asked the same question over and over. Who am I? Our answers are heard every moment by the devices we ourselves put in place to challenge us, to test us, to make us remember in the long run as we subjected ourselves to this tomb of horrors. Those devices adapt to these just as we program them to do. This is justice. The world and its reflections are performing diligently the service we made and paid them to do. Otherwise, how could we remember? We do take our time. Still, with no demand, with no judgment, with an unshakable patience, with a love whose purity we can only perceive in indirect glimpses, Truth seeks us, waiting for us to remember.